We're here to talk about your wonderful book, Unmastered, a book on desire most difficult to tell. What does that subtitle mean? It means two things, I think. The first is just a kind of straightforward sense that there's something difficult about speaking about desire and sexuality as a woman, and that that's very much what I address in the book. And the second sense is that there's also something difficult about telling what your desire is in the sense of knowing what that desire is. And that's something that I explore throughout the book, is how do we know what our own desire is when we're surrounded with so much chatter around sexuality and also a lot of judgment and anxiety, especially in the case of women. And expectations. Yes. Mm -hmm. I feel that, you know, for all the remarkable advances that we've been lucky enough to see, I think that there's still just a formidable tide of judgment and shaming around female sexuality that I've certainly found difficult in my own life and I'm mm. assuming that a lot of other women feel too. I think it's a difficult thing to do to work out what it is that you want in your own intimate life but that quest is really important. Mm -hmm. You've chosen a really interesting form for this book. Mm -hmm. um, it's very poetic, it's very personal, very memoiristic. Some pages there's only a single sentence mm -hmm. and then lots of lots of space around it. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose that form? Well, it kind of emerged very organically. It wasn't something I had planned in advance, but as it was emerging, I think I realized that it was a way to allow for a sense of spaciousness and a kind of generosity um, around questions to do with female sexuality, you know, be that questions about what it is that you want sexually or questions about how you feel about gender and power or questions to do with pornography or abortion. And I think I have felt that so much of the public language around those kinds of issues is is very constrained actually and, and requires women, and not just women, to take very kind of narrow, very sort of tight little positions on those questions that don't really allow for a sense of um, exploration, but also that don't allow for subtlety and ambivalence that can characterise one's own individual navigating of that terrain. And I realised that the book coming out in that form was a way to create a container that was large enough to, to hold that sense of kind of shifting ground and of things not being closed. I didn't want to pretend that there was any resolution in my life around these issues when, when there isn't, that there's, it's a constant sort of questioning for me. So the film just emerged as a way to address that question, I think. There are so many moods in this book, questioning, highly sexual, passionate, grieving, and playful. The only one that is missing, thank goodness, is the lecturing <laughs> mood. So you're, you yourself are an academic, but you're not writing as an academic here, mm. it feels. What I wanted to do was capture the feeling of what it is to explore some very difficult questions and you know very pleasurable questions but sometimes quite painful ones with a sense of um, compassion and curiosity because I think that really what certainly what I don't need and what I feel that women in general don't need is more lecturing it's such an ingrained response in all of us and I don't think I'm immune to it I think it's such a powerful cultural force to rule on people's experiences and to judge their pleasures and to diagnose them and to sort of partition things into what's acceptable and not acceptable. And I think that can just make it really hard for individuals in their own lives to explore what they feel and to express what they feel. So I feel that you know both the content of the book and, and the tone of voice of it and the structure of it were all ways to precisely avoid anything like a kind of lecture and tone because I don't want that in my life and I don't have any interest in doing that to anyone else. You told me once that you set out to write the book that you wanted to read mm. but you couldn't find. So why do you think it hadn't been written? There's lots of terrific writing about sexuality and that's you know theoretical and sociological and philosophical and all sorts of things but um, I always find myself wanting to know how these things manifest in people's individual lives? How do people individually cope with this incredibly complex realm and some very difficult feelings and you know, real challenges? 
how do they individually feel about the relationship between their sexuality and their families, in this instance, or their experience of abortion, and how that relates to their politics mm -hmm. around abortion. I suppose there are conventions of writing that are very powerful, mm -hmm. and one of those is the convention not to write yourself into the material so explicitly in the way that I've done. But I think that that omission of the personal can actually sometimes be harmful to the debate because I think there's a truth that can only reside in the messy, mm -hmm. ambivalent richness of life that needs ethically, I think, to be portrayed. Not because it can then represent everyone. Of course it can't. I can only talk about my own experience and it may or may not resonate with others. But so I just, I felt that there was a certain voice that I couldn't quite see around me and that would have been helpful for me over the last few decades to have encountered. And in the end, it was helpful to me to write it. Well, you say you're writing yourself into the material, but you are the material. Mm. Your experience, the things that you've seen, the things that um, you've done that have been done to you, I mean, mm. this is the subject. You made me laugh the other day when you passed a photo of Susan Sontag that was hanging in our hall and you stopped and you bowed in front of her. <laughs> what was that about? What did she mean to you? At one level, she's just a formidable figure. She's a formidable writer, the most incredible stylist, and also someone who I suppose represented something that I aspire to and that I think is important, which is a kind of lack of snobbery about what your material is, because I think she was so good at um, engaging in the most highbrow and what could be considered lowbrow. You know, she was writing about the most arcane philosophy and her very immediate experiences of being a tourist or of going to the cinema in Paris. So, you know, she, she, she weaved together, wove together even, the fabric of her intellectual and her personal life. So that's, that's something that I've always found really admirable in her. But I suppose I mean, the parts of Sontag's work that I cite in the book are her diaries, which came out recently, and uh, the first one which came out recently. And um, I suppose what was interesting to me was her searching for a voice in that diary. So you see her searching for her writerly self, and it's not an easy search for her, it's quite painful, but it's fascinating to watch. She grappled with that question of how much you write of yourself into the material, and she was ambivalent about it but it led to this tremendous body of work. But also, you know, the bits that I, that I write about in the book are to do with the relationship that she, with her marriage and her sort of desire to leave that marriage. And some of the sentences in those diaries where she explores the difficulty of being in a couple and the ways in which that can be constraining to her as a woman and as a writer and as a sexual person, but just and a, a mind in all its complexity, I found, I mean, it was like, I felt like I had been sort of doused in a cold shower and it was what woke me up from a certain kind of torpor in my own life. And it was, I think that was more than anything, the, the kind of most powerful trigger to writing the book was some of that material that just slapped me.